to our first um, or our maiden broadcast. Um, because of the coronavirus and the situation that we are faced with, um, our governments have thought it wise based on recommendations from uh, experts and observations of how other nations have handled this situation to advise that we be on lockdown. As a church, we spoke yesterday and I told you certain things that we are going to observe. And so it has become necessary together with the leaders that I speak to us today and this evening. But as is our tradition as believers, we must first lift up our meeting in prayer to God. And we want to thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of sitting down under you and to be able to talk to one another and sharpen each other. You said, as, a, as iron sharpened iron, so does a brother sharpen the countenance of his brother. And that's the reason why you brought us together, to be polished and to sharpen each other. Thank you for our wonderful governments that have thought it possible, both on the state, local government, and federal levels, to impose a lockdown and ask us that we be part of the process of preventing our infection and of spreading it. So we thank you. In their wisdom, they have acted according to your wise counsel. And we bless you. And we say, take the glory for this broadcast and this discourse today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, um, henceforth, we are not going to be having large gatherings, but we're only going to be gathering in our homes. And even where a home is too small or the people are too many, we'll advise that they fragment into smaller units further. Um, the coronavirus is a reality. I don't want anybody to think that it is not real. It is real. The very atmosphere that we breathe in every country is laden with bacteria and viruses. And it's just God in his infinite mercy that has kept us. We want to acknowledge the sufferings of our brethren in China. We want to so uh, acknowledge the sufferings of our brethren in doubt. The coronavirus has cast a specter of death over the earth. The intention of Satan is to give the impression that the end has come. Um, uh, people have circulated all kinds of newses. And I'll first give you a straight up advice that if your WhatsApp or your social media platforms are exposing you to unnecessary garbage, you might as well delete them. Because in this season, you have to be careful what you hear, how you hear it, and who you hear. All these verifiable sources, people say this is a verified source. Please, listen to what the person is saying. The moment you sense that they are spewing fear into the atmosphere, reject it completely. Some people have cast um, uh, uh, insults on the Nigerian system as if the Nigerian medical system cannot handle a crisis. Friends, have we forgotten so easily the sacrifices that our medical personnel have made in fighting Ebola, in fighting Lassa fever? We shouldn't. Dr. Adadivo, that down there in Lagos, held onto an Ebola case until she got infected. She refused to go home because she didn't want to spread it to her family. And she stayed there and died. And she paid the supreme price just so that the nation as a whole will be spared from it. So it's not like we're an incompetent nation. People should be careful what they say. What you speak is prophecy. I think we should be very, very careful. And I know indeed we should. If you don't know what to say, just give thanks to God and walk away. It is the right thing to do. The Bible says in all things give thanks. But Nigeria has fought a lot of things, a lot of battles. And Nigeria has been able to survive. So let nobody underestimate the work ethic of our medical personnel and the grace of God most importantly because the grace of God is what has kept us and the grace of God is not what you play with I believe that God has preserved Nigeria and I also believe that God has raised up people who will fight for this nation in this hour that the fact that he has spared us here is clear that he has set a canopy over us and it is in line with our prayers. I remember a few moments ago, I was in Kenya, in the town of Turi, and we were sitting down at a parent teachers association meeting. And on the field while we were eating, a Kenyan lady made a statement, and all of us asked her to elaborate. 
She said the greatest nation in Africa was Nigeria, and now she knows why. And we asked her why. She said she was posted here working with a multinational company. And that when she was posted to Lagos, because of the adverse publicity she had heard about Lagos, she cried and cried and cried. And then her boss made us, a, 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 indeed somebody got up today and was calculating the numbers of millions that are expected to die in Nigeria. I declare that prophecy false and I declare that voice a lying voice. The efforts of the government will not fail. The efforts of our people will not fail. The efforts of our medical personnel will not fail. Our health system will stand up. In spite of the fact that we feel we are inadequate, we should also realize where our strengths lie. Nigeria has intervened in nations and protected those nations from fragmentation and total destruction in the midst of war. Nigeria has been known and excelled in Sudan, in theaters of war like Liberia, Sierra Leone, without any help from the international community. And Nigeria, therefore, has proven herself to be resilient. The Ghanaians are in no way less than Nigeria. They also are exciting people, advanced people, competent people all over Africa. Indeed, Africans all over the world have distinguished themselves whenever they traveled to, in the diaspora. They have stood out and they have excelled. And most of them were trained from here. Now, the coronavirus says something. It says the end has come. But I announce to you that the end has not come, that the earth is not going to be wiped out by the virus. Even if it was the concoction of some people, it's not going to work out like that. Indeed, I want to tell you that as believers, the end time is not a threat to us. The end time is not a problem. The end time doesn't cast a specter of finishing or ending. In fact, the word end time fills every believer with excitement because we are not the first to confront the end time. We're not the first. Different people confronted the end time. Noah confronted the end time. The Lord told him, the end of all flesh is come. I'm going to wipe it out by a flood. But you have found favor for me. And so Noah heard the word and saw the vision. And according to Hebrews 11, when Noah saw the picture of what was coming, he was moved with fear and he began to react. Now that's the crux of the issue. The issue is not the threat you face. The issue is not the mountain that is before you. The issue is what, what will be your reaction? What's your responsibility in all of this? That's the issue at stake. As believers, that's what happens. God doesn't have to tell us a problem is going to come next year. Everyone that tries to prophesy what will happen next year does not understand the spirit of prophecy. The truth is we live by faith. If God was to tell Jesus there would be a storm in the sea that day, wouldn't he have told his disciples? Would there have been a need for them to go by faith? God didn't tell him. He just told them, let's cross over to the other side. The storm came is an incident, but then your reaction is a counter to that incident. And the Bible says, when Jesus stood up, he rebuked the winds and commanded the storm to be calm and the waves became quiet and they straight away got to the shore. So what did Noah do when he was confronted with the end time? He was told the sins of humanity has reached high heavens. And I hear a lot of people pontificating about how sinful, how sinful. And let me announce this to you. The Western world is overwhelmed. And we that are the third world are seem seemingly spared. Isn't that an act of mercy? Don't think that the Western world is sinful. Are they most, less sinful than us? Is there any sin in the world that is not all over the world? Every sin is all over the world. Mankind as a whole has fallen, but God has spared us. Perhaps because he knew that this would overwhelm us. Our medical facilities will not be enough to handle it. But we thank God for that all the same. And we still send out a word to our brethren in the West that are struggling, that God will spare them. God cannot forget the prayers of the fathers of America. God cannot forget the founding fathers of the faith in England. God cannot forget the prayers of the, of the Irish God cannot forget the work that the German fathers did. God cannot forget that the Bible was put together there by Tyndale in Germany. God cannot forget Austria. He can't forget Switzerland. Even if the current generation does not worship God, the prayers of the fathers is working. However, we call the current generation to return. It is wrong for us to chase God out of school, chase prayer out of school, and take a ridicule everything that has to do with God. It is wrong. 
It is important for us to know that sin is a problem, but there is a way that has already been made. And the fact that we are not running to the exit is a tragedy in itself. Because you have to identify the exit and you must run for it. Jesus is the exit with the calamitous end. Jesus is the exit if you do not want to partake in the lake of fire. Jesus is the exit, exit that has already been prepared for you to change address, leave death and go into life, eternal. Jesus is the exit that would bring you into the promises of God. He's an exit, but he's an entry at the same time, simultaneously. He exits you out of hell, but he takes you into the kingdom of his dear son. And he separates you from those who will spend their eternity in the lake of fire. Albeit you know that that is the real crux, the lake of fire. The lake of fire, hell is the domain of Satan. But the lake of fire is the punishment God himself has set up for death, for hell, and for Satan. And you must not go there. It was only designed for demons. No son of God should go there. And you are the creation of God. You must know that God loves you more than your mother knows you. And your mother loves you. Because before your mother knew you, God knew you. He's the one that needs you in her womb. Fearfully and wonderfully, he puts you together. Your father is not the beginning of your life. You are a spirit. You are as old as God. Because he created you in the age where nobody could take time. He created you like him, a spirit, in his image and in his likeness. But for administrative purposes, here on earth we have fathers, we have mothers, and we are sons and we are daughters. It is so that there will be order, so that man will be guided back from the fall into the place of restoration. And I declare your restoration is here today. So Noah was confronted with the, old, with the end time. He was told the end of the, of the world has come. And indeed it was true. The end of the world came all over the earth, in mountains, in my village, in mountains, all over the earth, in caves. There are relics that identify that. Look, there was a, an, a, a, a different creation that existed before and it was wiped out. The evidence of asphyxiation and of flooding is everywhere. We cannot deny that there was a flood. But what did Noah do? That's the issue. What Noah did is what we should do in this corona matter. The end has come. That's what corona is saying. It's a boast. And we send it back to the pits of hell. But we declare in its place that the harvest has come. Because what did Noah do? The Bible said he built an ark and saved his household. This is the time for us to thrust the sickle. The harvest is white. The laborers are few. Will believers die in the virus? Yeah, they will. Whether the virus kills us or not, something else will take you. Death is inevitable. But what you do before you go is what's going to determine what you will enjoy in eternity. So the virus may claim some of us. Yeah, and if it claims the world, we are not going to laugh. Because if it claims someone that is not saved, we are upset because we know that that's not the end of his problem. When he leaves this place, there will be the judgment that will take him to the lake of fire. So every believer, your sickles are sharpened. How do we know? Because the harvest is white. The moment the harvest is white, it means God has already done a work on your sickle. So get up and thrust it. Even if you can only catch a few sheaves, after a while you will get the, the hang of the harvest and you'll be bringing in bunches. That's the thinking of the word of the Lord. That's the thinking. Noah saved his three sons. Noah saved his wife. Noah saved the wives of his three sons. Now listen, Noah was a preacher just like Lot. The Bible says Lot was a preacher of righteousness. But by the time Lot was leaving Sodom, which was his own end time too, the end came on Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about. And the angel of the Lord told Lot, this cities are condemned and God will destroy them tomorrow by fire so get out of here and Lot couldn't even convince his family to come with him his family that was married in Sodom they laughed at him his in-laws laughed at him only his two virgin daughters unmarried went out with him and his wife and on the way his wife turned back broke the commandment and she looked at the destruction and the Bible says she became a pillar of salt so listen to me. This is a drastic contrast between the two. Both of them faced the end time. But Noah saved his family. And Lot didn't save his family. Neither did he save anyone out of Sodom. 
nor out of Gomorrah. That's a tragedy. What are you going to do? I send you back now as salt in the earth. That's what Jesus says. He sends us back as light in the world. He sends us back as a city set on a hill. He sends us back as the river of God that makes glad the city of God. That's how he sends us. And that's how I send you back. That's how I send you back. I send you back to go into your communities and harvest the community, starting from your family. When the rich man, uh, the parable of the rich man was told and Lazarus, the Bible says that the moment they hit hell, the lake of fire, and um, the bosom of Abraham, both of them had only one consideration. The rich man said, my brothers. That was what he thought about. It means that if you die today, your greatest concern will be your family. Humongous cities like Lagos have all kinds of mixture. And it, is, it presents a clear opportunity for you to thrust in the sequel, starting with your family, just to ensure nobody goes to the lake of fire. SARS, everybody that makes heaven, is not going to make heaven on any criteria, not on good works, not on moral deeds, not on how clean your record is. You're only going to be in heaven because you were forgiven. Mm -hmm. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. These are clearly spelled out scriptures that bring us life and they bring us hope. So if anybody around you is not being forgiven, tell them and share the gospel with them so that they can stretch out their hands. Indeed, at the end of this broadcast, I'll give you the opportunity. If you want to be a believer and you want to receive forgiveness for your sin, no other religion talks about sin and the way out. And Jesus is the only way that has ever proffered he came in as a prophet of God, came in as an apostle, came in as an evangelist, came in as a pastor. He gathered the sheep, came in as a teacher. His name was Rabbi. Everybody called him Rabbi, Rabbi. Because his teaching was legendary. He exposed the kingdom and revealed the Father and brought to light the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. No man could have intercepted the knowledge of the Spirit. The Spirit is, is a world invisible a world you can't touch. Only Jesus could have brought him to light. Because they are one. They are the Trinity. So don't let the corona tell you it's the end of the world. Every infection that came, every disease said the same thing. Cancer said the same thing. HIV said the same thing. Everybody said the same thing. Leprosy. But they all were conquered. And indeed, they all will be conquered. They all will be conquered. As long as man is on the earth, God has chosen man to be his resting place. And God is going to walk through man to conquer it. The scientific exploits we are making today, they are because of God working inside of men. The mechanical advances we are seeing on the earth is because of the spirit of God walking inside of man. Man was created in the image of God. All the nations that have rejected God, I think you should see your shame now. And it's time for you to return. All of you that have wimped away and run into the caves and hidden yourselves because you don't want to confront your communities. It's time for you to come out and confront your communities. Tell the story of your industrial revolution. It started with the Spirit of God. It was the move of the Spirit that made you as comfortable as you are. Even when you colonized nations and you looted them and built your edifices, God still in his mercy forgave you and permitted you to still enjoy the dividends. Because God, God doesn't take the dividends of sin from you. He doesn't. The sorcerer in Samaria, he, God left him with his money. He was a witch doctor and he made a lot of money. And then when he saw the disciples laying hands on, on people and people were getting filled, he offered them that money. God doesn't take money from a prostitute. Because, uh, and we believe God that in his proactivity in this season, he's going to make laws that will spare our state Amen. and will become a model to other states in the nation. Amen. God bless Buhari, our, our president, and all the ministers that serve with him. The Lord bless them in this season. Amen. And the Lord help them Amen. to take measures that are going to spare us. Amen. And we remember everybody all over the world, and we declare this word. If you find me, in this broadcast, send it as far as you can send it so that somebody's heart will receive hope. Yeah. In the coming days, we may translate stuff to Hausa and other languages just to be able to reach you. The Lord bless you. Yeah. 
The Lord bless you. Amen. We declare peace in England, Amen. peace in Germany, Amen. peace in France. Amen. Lift up your voices. Let us declare peace all over the earth. Lendaro de kumpadi kapaba munde metabu kansali gadaino. Shendole de bona mati zakroto bina mako sali di biana mai. Shende lunguna bikato zote brude bina mati zakroto bina mako taya. The tyrants, the tyrants, the tyrants. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Landori the Buddha Buddha Matu Sote Patayanga. Ege the Buddha Matu Sak Lokoto Boy. Peace, Lord Jesus. Peace. We receive your help. Your help for the helpless. Hope for the hopeless. Peace for the troubled. Definition, clarity for the uncertain, for the confused and distracted. We receive peace. 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 Oh, la bane bota sande la boca era. Yes, yes, yes. Thank him. La brata mada bona maka sonde re de bona mata shadow la bana ba. Bless him. Bless him. Hi everybody. And I'm welcoming you to our first um or our maiden broadcast. Um because of the coronavirus and the situation that we are faced with. Um, our governments have thought it wise based on recommendations from uh, experts and observations of how other nations have handled this situation to advise that we be on lockdown. As a church, we spoke yesterday and I told you certain things that we are going to observe. And so it has become necessary together with the leaders that I speak to us today and this evening. But as is our tradition as believers, we must first lift up our meeting in prayer to God. And we want to thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of sitting down under you and to be able to talk to one another and sharpen each other. You said, as, a, as iron sharpened iron, so does a brother sharpen the countenance of his brother. And that's the reason why you brought us together, to be polished and to sharpen each other. Thank you for our wonderful governments that have fought it Italy, in England, according to the reports we hear in America. And we want to applaud the government of America for asking and dedicating a day for prayer. Indeed, one of the reasons why I'm excited I'm a Nigerian is you hardly find a Nigerian who is not a believer in God. There are no atheists here. All of us believe in God and we believe in his deity. And so, uh, as a nation, we thank God that we had the opportunity yesterday to worship and talk about the virus together as a family. Albeit, I found out this afternoon that the government had imposed or had suggested we not gather. I regret that publicly because we were unaware. Now, when it comes to the coronavirus, one of the things, um, uh, because we will not be gathering um, in the assembly, at the King of Kings or King of All Kings Church of the Capstone. I am therefore telling you that it's time for us to have online church at the home. And we are here together with the leaders we have deliberated. You are going to get memo that will suggest to you the number of broadcasts we'll be having a day. I'll be leading you in prayers in the morning and in the evenings and perhaps in the afternoon, whatever the frequency we choose is. The purpose of it is to sharpen you because whenever you are isolated, two things might either happen. One, you may be in a retreat with God, and a retreat is a tactical maneuver in a military situation where you, you retreat so that you can gain the advantage over your adversary. Or you might be isolated in a corner, and then you now become a victim of Satan's bombardments. In either case, the church is supposed to be a shield. The church will pray for you and the prayer of faith will save you from the fiery darts of Satan. We'll take you out of the firing line. So we are going to be providing this material every day, which will become a sandwich for you, under which you can thrive and survive and your faith can grow stronger and stronger in the days ahead of us. Now, for the avoidance of doubt, the coronavirus has cast a specter of death over the earth. The intention of Satan is to give the impression that the end has come. Um, uh, people have circulated all kinds of news. And I'll first give you a straight up advice that if your WhatsApp or your social media platforms are exposing you to unnecessary garbage, you might as well delete them 
because in this season you have to be careful what you hear, how you hear it, and who you hear. All these verifiable sources, people say this is a verified source. Please, listen to what the person is saying. The moment you sense that they are spewing fear into the atmosphere, reject it completely. Some people have cast um, uh, uh, insults on the Nigerian system as if the Nigerian medical system cannot handle a crisis. Friends, have we forgotten so easily the sacrifices that our medical personnel have made in fighting Ebola, in fighting Lassa fever? We shouldn't. Dr. Adadivo down there in Lagos held on to an Ebola case until she got infected. She refused to go home because she didn't want to spread it to her family. And she stayed there and died. And she paid the supreme price just so that the nation as a whole will be spared from it. So it's not like we're an incompetent nation. People should be careful what they say. What you speak is prophecy. I think we should be very, very careful. And I know indeed we should. If you don't know what to say, just give thanks to God and walk away. It is the right thing to do. The Bible says in all things give thanks. But Nigeria has fought a lot of things, a lot of battles. And Nigeria has been able to survive. So let nobody underestimate the work ethic of our medical personnel and the grace of God most importantly because the grace of God is what has kept us and the grace of God is not what you play with I believe that God has preserved Nigeria and I also believe that God has raised up people who will fight for this nation in this hour that the fact that he has spared us here is clear that he has set a canopy over us and it is in line with our prayers. I remember a few moments ago, I was in Kenya, in the town of Turi, and we were sitting down at a parent teachers association meeting. And on the field while we were eating, a Kenyan lady made a statement, and all of us asked her to elaborate. She said the greatest nation in Africa was Nigeria, and now she knows why. And we asked why. She said she was posted here working with a multinational company. And that when she was posted to Lagos, because of the adverse publicity she had heard about Lagos, she cried and cried and cried. And then her boss made a, 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 a snide comment at her to the effect like, don't be silly. And she, she began to cry for another number of days. And she was asking herself, why would somebody call me silly because of work? And then a Nigerian colleague said to her, no, he didn't mean it. That's the way we talk here. And she said that further sank her down. But then she said after a while, someone invited her to church and she began to attend church. And in that church, she observed people coming with, the nature of people came with money to give us offerings. She said she saw that in the offerings, people were generous, excited. At first she thought it was repugnant that people would give tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions to church. Because where she was coming from, she thought, look, just save what you have. All these people are trying to get at your money. But that the more she talked with the parishioners, the more she discovered that they were doing it willingly from their hearts because they wanted to sponsor the gospel. And then she looked and observed that Nigeria had some of the most remarkable ministries and ministry stories, ranks to riches stories. It's not true that everybody is a charlatan. There may be one or two people here and there that are bad eggs. But truly, the power, miracle working, the miracle working power, and the transformational power of the gospel is in view fully in Nigeria. And she said, one day she said to herself, no wonder Nigeria is rich. That in spite of the corruption and in spite of all the crises going on and mismanagement, Nigeria is still standing. And she said she ascribed it to the giving power of the Nigerian church. And she remarked that only the Nigerian church alone is sending ambassadors all over the world. And only the Nigerian church has that culture of joy, excitement, even when it comes to giving unto the Lord. She said when she was posted to South Africa, that she began to cry this time because she was leaving Nigeria. And she said she had learned a lot. And indeed in that gathering at the football field, she had brought a cooler of food and she shared it to all of us Nigerians. She said, that's the way Nigerians do. They share everything they have with everybody. 
I'd like you to know that the grace of God is over our nation. His good hand that was upon Nehemiah is upon us. And he's leading us and guiding us. And he'll bring us safely. It's clear from the coronavirus that it is in vain men prepare a horse for the day of battle. Safety is of the Lord. And all of us in Nigeria believe in God. Whether you are Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, a shrine worshiper, all of us believe in God. And all of us know that the council of peace is what exists between God and humanity. If it is with God, then he has a council of peace. And so we expect peace from him. He speaks peace only to us. Now, let me say something about the coronavirus. As, as I said at the beginning, this virus has created the impression that the world is coming to an end. Indeed, somebody got up today and was calculating the numbers of millions that are expected to die in Nigeria. I declare that prophecy false, and I declare that voice a lying voice. The efforts of the government will not fail. The efforts of our people will not fail. The efforts of our medical personnel will not fail. Our health system will stand up. In spite of the fact that we feel we are inadequate, we should also realize where our strengths lie. Nigeria has intervened in nations and protected those nations from fragmentation and total destruction in the midst of war. Nigeria has been known and excelled in Sudan, in theaters of war like Liberia, Sierra Leone, without any help from the international community. And Nigeria, therefore, has proven herself to be resilient. The Ghanaians are in no way less than Nigeria. They also are exciting people, advanced people, competent people, all over Africa. Indeed, Africans all over the world have distinguished themselves whenever they traveled to, in the diaspora. They have stood out and they have excelled. And most of them were trained from here. Now, the coronavirus says something. It says the end has come. But I announce to you that the end has not come. That the earth is not going to be wiped out by the virus. Even if it was the concoction of some people, it's not going to work out like that. Indeed, I want to tell you that as believers, the end time is not a threat to us. The end time is not a problem. The end time doesn't cast a specter of finishing or ending. In fact, the word end time fills every believer with excitement. Because we are not the first to confront the end time. We are not the first. Different people confronted the end time. Noah confronted the end time. The Lord told him, the end of all flesh is come. I'm going to wipe it out by a flood. But you have found favor for me. And so Noah heard the word and saw the vision. And according to Hebrews 11, when Noah saw the picture of what was coming, he was moved with fear and he began to react. Now that's the crux of the issue. The issue is not the threat you face. The issue is not the mountain that is before you. The issue is what, what will be your reaction. What's your responsibility in all of this? That's the issue at stake. As believers, that's what happens. God doesn't have to tell us a problem is going to come next year. Everyone that tries to prophesy what will happen next year does not understand the spirit of prophecy. The truth is we live by faith. If God was to tell Jesus there would be a storm in the sea that day, wouldn't he have told his disciples? Would there have been a need for them to go by faith? God didn't tell him. He just told them, let's cross over to the other side. The storm came is an incident, but then your reaction is a counter to that incident. And the Bible says when Jesus stood up, he rebuked the winds and commanded the storm to be calm and the waves became quiet and they straight away got to the shore. So what did Noah do when he was confronted with the end time? He was told the sins of humanity has reached high heavens. And I hear a lot of people pontificating about how sinful, how sinful. And let me announce this to you. The Western world is overwhelmed. And we that are the third world are seem seemingly spared. Isn't that an act of mercy? Don't think that the Western world is sinful. Are they most, less sinful than us? Is there any sin in the world that is not all over the world? Every sin is all over the world. Mankind as a whole has fallen. But God has spared us. Perhaps because he knew that this would overwhelm us. Our medical facilities will not be enough to handle it. But we thank God for that all the same. And we still send out a word to our brethren in the West that are struggling. That God will spare them. God cannot forget the prayers of the fathers of America. God cannot forget the founding fathers of the faith in England. God cannot forget the prayers of the, of the Irish. 
God cannot forget the work that the German fathers did. God cannot forget that the Bible was put together there by Tyndale in Germany. God cannot forget Austria. He can't forget Switzerland. Even if the current generation does not worship God, the prayers of the fathers is working. However, we call the current generation to return. It is wrong for us to chase God out of school, chase prayer out of school, and TBN, Faith Channel, Daystar, every channel. There are several of them. Audio and video. Watch, read, listen, meditate. Some of you are almost dying because you are panicking for money and you run up day and night and you cannot sleep. This is your opportunity to sleep. God just helped you. Because greed will not save you. There's no, all of us have pursued all kinds of things. This is the moment for you to realize the things that matter. After you bought all the things that you got, you bought the cars, you bought everything, now you can't go out. So that you begin to reprioritize. Every plan you have made, my friend, that's how one day it will stop. The coronavirus has stopped the world, but one day death will stop you. And you will watch all your efforts go. And am I saying that you should sit down and do nothing? No, I'm saying be balanced. This is the time to retreat. Every church, every assembly, every people, every chorister, every usher, retreat. Use this as a time to retreat. God, when you come back, the reign of the Spirit is going to come. All of us know, after a wilderness comes a rain, a rain of glory. After three and a half years of famine, Elijah said, I hear the abundance, the sound of an abundance of rain. Get up, get up, get up, Ahab. And he had run the chariots to Jezreel. After this, we're going to have a massive, a massive, a massive rain shower. And that rain is going to drench the earth. It will equalize the earth. Some leaders of the earth are going to see the futility of the, the games they've been playing, the wars they've been fighting, and they would realize that God put them in that office for a purpose. Then they would turn around and remember the poorer nations. Poorer nations are going to discover their eternal destiny. Some of us were not designed to make money. We were designed to carry the gospel. We are like eagles bearing the word on the wings that God has given us. Some nations are going to wake up. They will wake up from complete atheism, absolute paganism, and they will see the living God. The cross of Jesus is going to be the crux of the matter. And let me warn you, I'll be bringing that message in a few days' time. The Bible calls us to trust him, not to test him. Don't go out and take corona from the body of somebody and say, let me prove to you that this thing will die in my heart, hands. He didn't say you should test him. You must not. You cannot test the Lord your God. You cannot. He says trust him. He says if you accidentally take poison, it won't hurt you. If you accidentally march on a serpent, he would deliver you. He's the deliverer. So he will deliver you from corona. But don't test him. Don't go and do those silly games, those fantasy games. You know, when you watch WWE, they tell you don't try this at home. Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited because I believe that I have brought you in sync with Jesus tonight and I have brought you in line with scripture. I made a beeline for the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel. So what would you do when they say to you, this is your last day? That's the end time. Don't let's lie. All of us are scared of death and are scared that this is the end for us. Because it's a virus. Everybody is saying it's not airborne, it's not this, it's not that. It's, however it is, why is it infecting so many people at once? In large numbers. It came from China. China says there is no new cases. Is that true? We Africans by nature are skeptical. We're thinking maybe after this now we hear that half a billion people have died in China. And the rich killed the poor so that they can create space for themselves. That's on a lighter note. So we don't care how corona comes, how it is infected or how it's not infected. We have heard we'll be washing our hands. We'll stop touching our faces. We will use sanitizers. We will use jeek bleach and then just sanitize and wipe up the tabletops in our kitchens. We will make sure we isolate and we will feed upon the word of God most importantly. This is a fast. 
that God has imposed upon us. And a fast is not you denying yourself food. A fast is for you to keep yourself on a lean diet, but feasting on the word of God. It's not a fast until you separate yourself from food and you feast on the bread of life. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what a fast is. Mm -hmm. So it's time to redefine the world. I am excited because after I come out from this moment, I'm going to receive a new world. A brand new heaven and a new earth. Because God is redefining the psychology of the earth. He's training us all at once. He has brought us to school. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are no presidents, no senators. There are no primary school pupils. There are no university pupils, uh, students. There are no professors. All of us are in God's class. And we are learning him from China to America. Partly because I have failed. The church failed to keep pace with him and to run the race like he would want it. So Jesus has taken over. He's the one pulverizing the nations of the earth. He's got our attention. He ceased rain in Israel and he got their attention that the 800 prophets of Baal and Asherah were wiped out by Elijah. And the whole of Israel declared, truly, God our Father is God. I want to thank you. And for all of you who are members of church, I want to let you know that we'll be meeting in families like we did church in the house. We did set up church in the house for church growth. We did it when the time came and it was necessary. And now the time has come. You will meet in families. We will break bread every day. Make sure you buy one or two Pepsi Colas and keep them on your side. If you don't have Pepsi Colas, keep Zobo, keep Kunu, and then buy biscuits, hard biscuits, so you can crack them and use them for communion. This is the reason why God gave it, especially to the church in the Middle Belt and the North. Let's not reject these promptings of the Spirit. Some of you have been trained wrongly. You think that you can only take communion in church. It's a lie. Satan doesn't attack you only in church. Mm -hmm. 